So I, I thought for a while about what to talk about, and then I, um, I put in this thing, which is another human thing. So if you were in my talk just minutes ago, I focused on human aspects. And uh, if you were bothered by that and are looking for a more technical talk now, you're in the wrong place. So this is your chance to go see some of the very interesting other people doing talks at the moment. This is going to be about humans as well. Um, and um, maybe even a little more than the last one. Because what I found is that um, uh, I'm at a lot of conferences and I talk to a lot of people. I like doing the hallway thing where you talk with people about their actual situation and actual projects. So please come up and talk to me in, if, if you find me somewhere and want to have a conversation about those things. Um, and I find that many of them struggle with the difference between what you experience at a conference and what you then have when you get back home. And some of that is part of the, of the talk um, I'll do now. So the story arc, you know, every talk needs sort of a story, is as usual, we'll start, you know, with fantastically bright sunlight and everything's going to be awesome, blue sky, and then um, it'll be really, really bad. Um, and then at the end, we'll arrive at something that's sort of okay, right? So that's the story. And I've split it up into two parts. So the first one is very visual, and I'm going to rant a bit, use that. And then I, when I looked at that, I thought, well, thought, well maybe that's a little too, you know, not, not concrete enough, not usable enough. So I've added a, a way more traditional thing at the end, which is a set of patterns, and so the two, so the two parts make up this, uh, this talk. So let's talk about conferences. What do you experience when you're at a conference? What is it to you? I think most people, when they go to a conference, they are there for um, the experience and for things like the great new technology, right? It's, it's so awesome to see all of those really cool things that you may have heard of, but also may never have heard of before. And you see knowledgeable people talk about this in entertaining presentations, right? They, so you have, so if it's a good talk, then you're entertained for 45 minutes and you've possibly even learned something. And there's lots of cool people around you, and you can talk to them, and they will tell you about the awesome projects that they do, and, and it, depending on how well you know. I mean, after a while, you notice that everyone's, everybody's just doing, you know, basically the same thing, just with slightly different means, and everybody, as we say in German, cooks with water. I don't know whether it's a saying in English. Um, but um, you actually like hearing those success stories, and you, you like hearing about how other people have applied this new thing, this new methodology, a new tool, new technology to their set of problems and how it helped them, and everything's really great. And then suddenly reality hits you, right? Reality hits you when you come back home. Uh, like in my last talk, this may not happen to any of you, right? I mean, when you come back home to your respective companies, everything's going to be awesome and great. But I've noticed that people sometimes struggle with sort of Getting the, getting the enthusiasm transferred to their actual working life. I mean, those colleagues of yours, they weren't at the same conference, and they, they look at you funny for a few days until you sort of fit in with the rest again. That's at least my experience with some people. So that's what I'm going to focus on first. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to actually affect, effect change, right? How, wh why? why do we struggle? so much with changing our own environments. I mean, if things were so easy as they seem in conference talks, this could all be done by maybe, you know, a 45-minute presentation. I mean, you were convinced, you looked at something and it sounded really awesome, you want to do it, and so, you know, maybe you just need to deliver that 45-minute talk. Ah, it's not going to work. And I think the reason for that is that, um, as, with, as it is most of the time, the reason for that is that we're human. I mean, these are all superhuman, but in our organizations, we're surrounded by humans, and those humans have reasons for why they struggle with accepting your ideas of the right kind of change. So I've decided to look for stereotypes. I thought, what are some of the things that I've seen and that maybe you've seen? And if you can think of additional stereotypes to the one I present, please come to me and tell me about them or put them in, your, as a, put them in as a question, as a suggestion. So these are the stereotypes I'd like to focus on. Let's look at this one first. This is the professional tech skeptic. The professional tech skeptic is very knowledgeable, very bright, and also very negative. Because whatever it is you come up with from your conference, the professional tech skeptic will be easily able to uh, tell you why it's a stupid idea. He or she, of course, although in this case, 
probably more often he, will find the negative things very, very easily and, and focus on them with laser focus, right? This is all going to fail because you haven't thought about this particular thing. And then you say something, well, of course we've thought about this, and everybody agrees that this is not something that can be ignored, and you have to be careful, but still, you've lost that particular race. The professional tech skeptic can also be found on certain online um, environments, you know, like on Reddit or Hacker News. Or if you happen to be German, Heise, develop, Heise News, uh, Heise Forum. So in German, we have this, I know this very well, that's why I use, always use it as an example. You have those fantastically lucid posts by people who obviously really are unhappy in their lives. Right? They, they invest so much time on a work day, like half an hour explaining why all of what you just wrote is just completely stupid and wrong. And they're probably all super smart, but they also probably lead a very sad life and some some job where they can focus on those things. Okay. Anyway, I digress. So, professional ske tech skeptic, my first negative stereotype here. The next one is uh, what I like to call the legacy lover. Um, I've given him a suit for um, a good reason here, because very often these are people who, ver who stick to um, something that has been there for a long, long time. And if you're the sort of person who goes to conferences and who likes new things, it's highly unlikely that you're very much in love with something that's been there for a very long time. You'll probably want to get rid of it. You'll probably want to do something new, something cooler. Not necessarily because it's cooler, but because you believe that the new thing would actually help and be better. But the legacy lover sees things very differently. They will always tell you, well, but we already have that. Well, that doesn't work in our environment. Well, we've always done things that way. I don't see any reason to change that particular thing. And they're also very much attracted and an expert in this particular piece of software or environment that we're talking about here. Then we have the vendor agent. The vendor agent doesn't necessarily have to be an employee of the vendor, although you sometimes have your doubts, right? It's the person who always favors the solutions of a particular party involved here, right? They'll always, always talk about this these particular parties' products, they always seem like the best ones. And even if something new comes along, they wait until this particular other vendor comes up with their copy of that new thing. And then it suddenly becomes great, right? And, you, and even, the, you know, even the announcement of something, even saying that this vendor plans to do something like at some un undefined point in the future might make the vendor agent suggest that you wait for that because it's from our reliable partner here. You have the process protector. Uh, the process protector uh, will make very sure that the actual way you do things, um, the cadence and the sequence and the steps and the amount of time it takes, um, really becomes an asset in itself. It's never the case that the process itself is, uh, is supposed to be endowed or could possibly be changed. That's the, whatever you suggest doesn't match the existing process, so obviously it's the wrong solution. And then you have somebody who I also don't like that much. It's the yay-sayer. And the yay-sayer is somebody who, who's really somebody you can really struggle with for a long time because they will agree with you. You will suggest something and they will say yes but they won't mean it. Right? And they will do that again and again. And every time you go to them and say, well, but now we should do it, they'll say, yeah, of course. I said so last time, I still absolutely mean it. We should totally do that. And then they'll find a way to somehow let that, you know, fizzle out. That is something I've observed quite a few times. And then you have a distractor. Um, the distractor is somebody who will find a way to do something completely different, right? They'll, they'll use whatever you suggest to do something completely unpredictable, chaotic, um, from a completely other part of the, of the universe. And they are so unpredictable that you have no idea what's going to happen. They might have their own agenda, they might just be on, on drugs, you really don't know. You suggest something and they go somewhere else. I've, I've just, for some reason, I've just noticed that those are all dudes, right? I'm not suggesting that's a good thing, I'm just pointing it out. Good. So, that is the negative view of the whole thing. So, basically, if I stopped here, we could say that um, we will all want to do great things, but we can't have great things because people suck. But that's a very, very limited view of the world, and that's not my view. 
So I want to look at all of those people from a different perspective. I want to look at those stereotypes, but now I want to talk about why they may be right. What is it that they, what is the argument, what are the arguments that they might have that it could actually possibly be correct, that might actually help you? Let's talk about the first one. So maybe the professional tech skeptic actually has a point. I mean, it may just be that he or she is just doing all this to annoy you, and you could say, well, this person always disagrees with everything. Well, maybe they're just very perceptive. And maybe the fact that they suggest that your newfangled database is not so much better than the existing RDBMS or whatever it is that you want to pick these days, that maybe putting this sort of data in the cloud is not exactly what I want to do today, maybe they do have a point. Right? Typically, those people believe in what they say, and they have good reasons for this. And if you, if you actually discuss this with them, it can be very, very challenging. It can take a long, long time. But typically, you learn something. At least you learn something and then be able to disagree with them uh, on a more informed basis. Right? So I'd suggest to take those people seriously. Some of them are really just there to annoy you, and of course, then you don't want to do that. But at least look for them. The reason that those people are this way, that's, that's what I'm trying to say, is because the, you know, seeing, anticipating problems is part of intelligent behavior. Right? You, do, you don't do something that's very stupid because you're, you sort of anticipate what, what can go wrong if you did that, so you don't do it. And that's sort of the same motivation here. In a similar vein, the legacy lover that I mentioned might just be aware of the investment. Now, the investment can be an investment in lots of things. It can be investment in actual money into something that you bought, and that's probably the weakest of the arguments because of the sunk cost fallacy. That's when you believe that you have to continue doing the stupid thing because you already wasted so much money on doing the stupid, stupid thing that it would feel even worse if you didn't continue doing it, which is again, the, the worst possible reason to continue do some, to do something. So don't use that. But sometimes you have a different kind of investment. For example, that legacy system might be built using stupid technology. It might run on a stupid old platform. But it also may contain bug fixes accumulated over 10 years, special uh, uh, implementations for corner cases that you couldn't think of or would never think of if you built it again from scratch. It's an existing system. It has value. It possibly delivers value right now to somebody. So throwing it away should be a very conscious decision. Again, if it's for the wrong reasons, then don't take this too seriously, but at least understand some, some of the reasons people might want to do that. Sometimes they honestly just want to protect an, ex an existing investment and they fear that you and your youthful enthusiasm for the newfangled new tech thing just want to throw it away without, without uh, thinking of it. Similarly, the process protector may just be somebody who loves their processes or it may be somebody who actually from experience knows that those things are there for a reason. Sometimes it might be, like, it might be things like regulations. Sometimes it might be actual law. Sometimes it might be, you know, lessons learned in the past where something failed in a pretty a spectacular fashion and this process was established to take care, make sure this particular thing never happens again. Now, if you understand why the process is there, then you can argue with them on um, why your solution takes care of that problem in a different way. Like, for example, when people defend their release process, one of, my, one of my favorite things, right? We have this, these super complicated release management processes. When, when people defend them, they typically do so because at one point in time, some critical system was put into production and it didn't work. And the whole company didn't, I don't know, wasn't able to take in orders for a day. So this process was established and now somebody has to sign off and there have to be lots of tests. And before anything goes into production that affects the ordering process, it has to be triple checked. Um, and if you have a good argument, like we're going to do this way more reliably because we're now doing automated testing and we're going to do this way more reliably because we're only rolling it out to 1% of the, of, the, of, of the customers. If you have good arguments like that, then you have addressed the problem, but you have not ignored it. Sometimes you do have those arguments, but you forget discussing them with the process person because you just don't like them, because they're from a different kind of universe. Sometimes even the vendor agent might act out of, out of positive, um, a positive good thing, right? The vendor agent might just trust this particular vendor because they've had good experience with them in the past, right? They, they saved them at one point in time. They delivered whatever they had promised. They actually were good business partners. And 
they've you know helped them with whatever at some point in time so maybe that's a good reason for doing that I don't have much sympathy for the yaysayer um, because that is really just a an annoying thing and the motivation here um, is maybe not the best reason it might be different with a distractor the distractor might be just as convinced of their approach as you are of yours in fact you might appear a distractor to them right you might appear to be this crazy person who always go to a conference always goes to a conference and com comes back with a, a, another stupid idea that's going to be in fashion for like two or three years and then be replaced by something else so it's best to just ignore you um, so again be careful of of the, the motivation and the reasons here now what I wanted to point out is there are certain reasons why people act the way they do and there are certain ways you can look at that and understanding people's motivations is a very good preparation for dealing with them you know like you it's much easier to um, to to communicate with them much easier to agree with them much easier to convince them of something and much easier to learn from them if you know if you understand um, uh, why they are the way they are but the same of course is true for ourselves right I mean why do we want all this change maybe that's the bad idea maybe we shouldn't be doing that maybe we should save our employers money by not going to conferences and maybe we should stop trying to change stuff that works because obviously it works right so again that's kind of a very an oversimplification here I think there are bad reasons and good reasons and I mentioned some of them in my last talk so I'm going to repeat myself a bit here but obviously bad reasons are that you want to play with shiny new toys I mean by all means play with shiny new toys but playing is different from you know risking your companies or systems or organizations success by introducing something new first of all play with it that's a good idea but don't let your desire to to do something that's new um, override your your um, your rational thinking here so shiny new toys not a good reason another one that I mentioned before is this domain allergy thing right you're you much rather play with the tools than actually look at the end users problem and that is something that I've uh, that I observed in myself in the past I think I've, I've, I've come over this particular thing but I still observe it a lot in in other people so again if you don't have this consider yourself lucky but some people you know really really would be more would be a lot happier to work at an infrastructure company or to build very cool cloud stuff uh, you know add one of those cloud providers rather than just using that um, and that's not a good, good reason you need to whatever the I mean they simply pick a different domain that's fine if your domain is infrastructure by all means get to know everything about that particular domain if your domain is to build a monitoring tool or uh, or a container scheduler then of course invest the time and effort to do that right if that's if that's your if that's your expertise if that's what you do if that's what you sell if that's what you do for a living by all means but if it's not then stay away from or at least don't let it influence the your intellectual capacity to deal with the actual problem of your end users which is, which is typically not how fancy your kubernetes installation uh, looks in a similar vein um, cargo culting is a very very bad reason I think I've mentioned that as well um, you know just the the assumption that if you do things the way somebody else does them um, and then magically you'll get similar results sort of you know mistakes causation and correlation I mean it may be that they do this thing but they may, may not but that may not be the reason why they're successful at all so just doing it because somebody else does it is typically a very bad idea similarly community status you know like you want to be the one doing the talk you want to be the one at the meetup talking about how you've applied I don't know what whatever new fangled framework uh, whatever JavaScript build tool or um, I don't know whatever it is that you that you like these days whatever serverless environment um, uh, you're happy to play with this week um, you know if that's the if the reason is that you want to be the coolest kid on the block again that's probably not something that should influence your decisions here and again similarly CV driven development which is the kind of development that you do because you want to have that line in your CV right because you're actually looking for a job somewhere else it may be a good personal strategy it's not in the best interest of your employer neither your current nor your future employer right you don't want to well maybe your future employer if they're very selfish but in general 
you do not just want to do something for the sake of having done it once. But of course, if there are bad reasons, there are also good reasons, right? And there, I think there are a lot of good reasons. And most of us, I think, act because of those good reasons. We want to improve the world. I think that's, you know, it sounds stupid or, you know, um, like, a, you know like, a, like a general thing that has not, ha doesn't have anything to do with it. But I honestly think most of us do want to improve the world. We want to make the world a better place. We want to improve our own lives. We want to have more fun at work, which is fine. It's fine to want to have fun. And it's fine to, have, to want to have good tools and a good developer experience. And it's nice to be able to focus on interesting stuff as opposed to doing boring, to doing boring boilerplate. Right? You want to do interesting things and you want to do them efficiently and you want to feel valuable and productive because that's what motivates practically everyone I know. We want to improve our business. I, think, I honestly think most of us do. We're working somewhere and, I mean, those are, all, those are our employers. We want them to stay in business. We want them to make good money so that they can afford to pay us more. You know, we want them to be able to take risks so that, they can tr they can, that we can try out new things with them. That's, those are all good things. So, you could argue that in general you're just faced with, with, uh, with a challenge and you have to make up your mind, right? Sometimes when you come home from a conference, you, you, have different, you have different paths that you can choose here, right? Like in this little adventure game thing that I simulated here, right? So, what can you do? Sometimes, the most reasonable option is to just go somewhere else. And that's a perfectly fine thing. You know, if you really, really want to do something and you know your company won't do it for good reasons or bad reasons, but you still absolutely want to do it, then go work for somebody else or work for yourself. That's, that's fine. And sometimes that's a good option. Sometimes people choose this one. I'm, I put in the bicycle here because I spoke to somebody who I really, really, really admire or at least admired for his technical expertise, and I, I couldn't understand why he worked at this shitty company. Why would he work at a company like that that made every possible mistake? And he said, well, I can bike to work. And that's okay. I mean, it just means that professionally you've given up on your employer. You no longer believe that you can effect positive change. You no longer think that they're ever going to do the reasonable thing, but you don't really care. It doesn't really matter. Maybe you're working at a public company or, a, you know, you know at a a government subsidiary or something, maybe you are um, in a company that has so much money that it doesn't really matter whether you're there or not or your subdivision is successful or not. And maybe it's fine that you can do whatever you like for fun at night as opposed to at work. And I, personally, I would have never loved doing that. Um, I know a lot of people who would not be happy with doing that. So for most people, this is not an option, which leaves us with option three. And I present this gentleman here as sort of the intro to something that, like marketing and sales, really is a bad thing from a developer perspective, right? So, ah, developers, do developers want to, you know, play power games with politics? Yes. Yes, they do, at least if they want to effect change. If you want to change something, then you have to recognize that change is way more than just technology. And change, to a very large degree, is politics. Right, you have to understand the power dynamics and the influence factors and the way how you get somebody to agree. That's politics. That's, that's exactly what you need to do. Sorry. It's even related to economics, another one of those things that people don't really like who flee into technical jobs like we all did. Right, so I think you have to approach things differently if you really want to change your organization. So I've got some, some ingredients here. Um, I think technology is needed. But you also need this pr pragmatism. You have to be able to decide what hills you want to die on. Hopefully none. But you know, what are the most important things? What are the most important battles to fight? Because you can't fight all of them. Focus on some things. And then you add economics. You try to make sure that you're doing this for a reason that a business person can understand, which is typically a sign for it being a good reason. Um, and you add enough politics to actually get your, get, uh, achieve your goal. So in that vein, while I've you know, ranted a bit and talked about general things, I want to leave you with some more concrete stuff at the end. As promised, this is part two, which is the actual patterns. So I've tried to categorize some of the stuff that we've been doing when we help organizations do that into 
repeatable things. It's, it's work in progress. Again, please suggest additional patterns if they have them. And it's not really a pattern language yet or anything like that. It's just, just a collection of things that I found um, to work. And you probably, as for any good pattern or for any pattern, you'll find out that you recognize a lot of them, which is the point, right? So let's talk about this. The first one is this. It's, it's organic, right? It's gr it grows. It's not something that you introduce by... Um, by forcing everyone to follow your lead uh, because you went to a conference last week, from next week, Monday, everybody has to do this newfangled serverless microservices Kubernetes cloud deployment thing. Um, instead, you introduce things um, uh, slowly, right? You limit yourself. The innovation coin idea that I've mentioned before is the idea that you, that you decide for a limited amount of things that you want to fix in any particular setup. You don't do all of the things at once. You, you pick a few things and you say, okay, I, could, I would really love to try this, but not on this project. Because on this project, I'm already trying out these three things, so let's not do those other five as well. Now, this might end up in a very slow kind of change, right? It's going to take a long time. But it's probably more sustainable. It's the kind of change that will stay, because if introduced it slowly, you know, it's like it's, in that, it's not something that has the risk of being outlived by, uh, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't have the risk of that the, that the half-life of your, of your CTO is less than the half-life of your project. Right? So, um, you possibly can't have that much of an effect this way, right? If you do things slowly and in small increments, then it it's, may not be the, the really big thing that you want to do. So, maybe you can't do that. But maybe that is fine, right? Maybe you shouldn't be doing that to this particular piece of your part of the organization. A different idea is to is explicitly set up a playground, some place where you can do that, right? So you, you explicitly don't use your main product. You do something that's maybe not that important or maybe something completely new, something on a different, maybe something very, you know, a different kind of business model, a different kind of feature set that you've always wanted to play with, and you try your new architectural approach with this particular thing just to see how it works. And you sort of tie your success into this particular thing. It's amazing how much you can achieve, especially if you're in the kind of organization that has, that still, still does things the same way it did them 10 years ago, because the world has moved on and we can do things much quicker these days. So sometimes this will actually demonstrate that. There are a number of things that allow you to do that, that help you do that. So you, you might combine it with approaches that help you in quickly defining new products. Like, um, you know, the design sprint approach is one that, that we've applied a number of times now that I like a lot, which gives you a, a, a way to very quickly, within a week, come up with a user interface prototype and then test it with actual end users. And maybe that is something that you can then implement because it's very small and a very limited feature set using this newfangled architectural approach that you have there. Try to minimize risk here, but every time you take little risk, you don't have that much of a chance. That's very normal, right? So if you don't take any risk at all, it's going to be completely irrelevant. So you have to sort of find the right balance here. Another approach that I've now seen a number of times and I find really interesting is this idea of a know-how leapfrog. The idea here is to... Um, pick something that's really, really, really stupidly old and bad and use that and to just skip like 10 generations of IT transformations and directly go to that new fancy thing, right? So written ninjas don't take that too seriously here, right? So we, we pick something like, you know, this boring old mainframe system or maybe the system that's still running on that i-series AS400 system you have somewhere where really but clearly you know this is, doesn't have any future. And then instead of, you know, in a series of small transformations, uh, sort of reapplying the, the development of IT in the last 20 years to this particular system, you just move them directly to a serverless environment running on AWS or something like that, whatever it is that you fancy. Right? It's, it's interesting because you can, uh, can and should pick the existing people here. You really just make them skip a number of steps. And it actually might work out very, very well or very, very badly. That's highly unpredictable, depends on the people that we're talking about here. Some of them will really like that a lot. They will really love this challenge and this idea, and they're really doing something 
That seems weird to you because you probably have gone through all of those transformation steps within the last few years. But it's really, you know, something that, that can motivate a team. It can also demotivate people dr dramatically because they think, they might think, well, I'm too old to learn this stuff. I'm, I, I had decided to stay here for the next 10 years doing what I did for the past 20 and then go into retirement. Again, that's sort of the bicycle approach that they may have taken. And, and depending on your, the kind of organization that you're working at, you might want for them to leave, you might want for them to change, or you might keep them around to work with the legacy stuff, whatever. Another one that um, I like specifically because it works pretty well with business people is the idea of looking at benchmarks. And that's, I think, a, the most political move here. The idea is that you look at successful competitors and look at, the, uh, look at them to be role models. So you have to pick those whose architecture matches your destination architecture. You know, look around a bit. And if, that's, if you can turn that into a, in a, into a convincing story and say, look, look at this company, this is the way they do it. Look, I've seen them present at this conference. And, you know, not, talk, not a, something that is not related to your business, but somebody where, where people don't have to abstract too much, where they can see, well, this is, this is the one company that we're really afraid of, and that's what they're doing. That can end up being a very, very, um, a very, very good motivator. Specifically, if you're looking at disruptors, at companies that sort of disrupt your existing business model anyway. Right? You can hire some of those people with mixed results, as I've seen in the past. Um, they can be uh, former employees of, of your competitors and help you. Maybe that's not what you want, but maybe it's what your company should do. I don't know. Sometimes these are just cargo culting in a different form, right? You hire those people and think you're magically going to become that other company, but you don't really know whether it was those people responsible for the whole thing. Again, so possibly very convincing to the business people. Um, again, cargo culting risk, I think I already mentioned that. Again, remember, what we, want, what we want to do here is we want to create change. We want to successfully do things very differently. And I mentioned that one of the options is to leave, um, but there's sort of a, a different way of leaving, which is um, to sort of outsource, not really, outs not really outsourcing what I'm mentioning here. What I'm saying is um, creating a sub-organization that will do the new stuff. That is a move that many companies, especially big companies, do these days, right? They, they have such a big budget, it doesn't really hurt them to, you know, take 10 or 20 or 50 million euros or dollars and just, you know, use them to try something out because that's the kind of money that they don't worry about at all. That's what they spend on marketing, in a, I don't know, in a week. So you can try that and then you have these organizations that um, are often called innovation labs. So in Germany, they all get created in Berlin, right? So. Berlin, sort of the center, and there every big company founds a, an, an innovation lab in Berlin, which makes a lot of sense because there are practically um, uh, no companies looking to hire great people in Berlin, whatever. We have an office in Berlin as well, so it's fine. Still, so the people do that, and one of the things they do is they try to um, make it easy for those people to innovate because they don't have to play by the rules. Right. They don't have to adhere to the existing rules of the organization. They get an explicit, uh, um, they are explicitly allowed to do things differently. Now, I'm, I have to say, I'm not too big a fan of this approach, specifically if it's not a separate business model. So if you found a new company to, um, to do something different, not to do the same thing differently, but to do a different thing, that makes sense to me. Because, uh, at least that's a, at least that's a, at least I can understand why you would want to do that as a strategy. It's basically an investment. You set up this thing, you say, oh, don't worry about money, we'll keep you. Not a good idea, but you can tell them you'll have enough money to create a great product, build a great product, and maybe they can address a different market than you do. But that's often not what these companies do. What these companies often do is they hope that these people in this outsourced innovation lab organization will magically make their own products cool. There's a, there's a problem with that. It's actually an architectural problem, which is this lipstick on a pig problem, right? You have this back-end IT system that's your legacy, I don't know, insurance policy administration system running on a mainframe built in the early 80s. 
And that system is still maintaining policies, and you have a fancy, newfangled, cloud-based, um, I don't know, React, whatever, front-end, top of, but it still is limited by whatever the old system from 30 years ago can do. That's not going to help you. So I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical of this approach. Um, and of course, you also run a risk because every time you do those out, uh, outsourced or um, you know, these, these separate organizations, you always run into the people risk of, of those people hating each other or ignoring each other, right? So the, to the existing staff, these are the, the fancy hipster programmers who you know, take 25 minutes to make a cup of coffee and shop in weird food places, whatever, you don't really connect with them. And for these people, you are some boring, old-fashioned, suit-and-tie-wearing, mainframe programmer. That's what they call Java programmers, right? So you, you, have, this, you have this problem that you can't connect these worlds, and, and that is really clearly not going to help you. So I'm not a big fan of this, as you may have noticed. Something that I think works very well is the idea of um, sort of um, hijacking something else, right? So if you make your architecture change effort part of something else, then it becomes much more probable to, uh, to actually happen, right? So you, you have a business-driven approach, you have a business problem, you have new features, and those new features are best built in this particular way. You don't really talk about all this technical stuff about new architecture, about any of that. You just piggyback onto the existing thing, right? So whatever it is that you pick up, um, you just make the cost of this transformation part of the cost of the overall business project. If you don't have a business project, now is not a good time to introduce a new architecture. Right? So you have to, I think that's true in general, you have to um, uh, think of something. So do the right thing and don't talk about it. Again, depending on the organization, that may be a very, very risky thing to do, right? Somebody might discover that you did that. Hopefully you're already done and successful by the time somebody does. Maybe you don't want to take that risk, that's fine as well. Right. So you have a chance and also the challenge to prove the benefits because afterwards you can say, well, look, we've built this. Have you noticed that we've built this in three months? Can you remember that we ever built anything in three months? Most organizations don't, right? So if you've, if you've been able to build something very quickly that actually delivers value and that looks good and that customers like, then that's a fantastic, fantastic argument for a certain kind of architecture. Another sneaky move that I've seen people do, uh, or maybe, maybe, you do, you, maybe you don't find it sneaky, but stupid, who knows? Some people do this purely for HR motivations. And you can exploit that. You can talk to people and say, well, we don't find developers anymore. I think I know why. The reason is we're doing stuff that nobody wants to touch. You know, our technology is so old, or so proprietary, or so specific, or so rare that we don't find people who want to do that. We, don't, we can't even find people who want to learn how to do that because they think it's, it's wasted. If they learn this, they're never going to be able to apply it anywhere else. So why would they waste their lives learning how our proprietary, I don't know, how, how our proprietary Eclipse-based COBOL code generator works? I mean, sure, I could try. Well, then maybe you can try um, hiring people from other, from other parts that were not, not that much in demand, and I applaud that because I think it's an awesome chance to train people to do something. But again, it can't be the only solution. You have to mix people who enter from different fields with people who are experienced so you get the benefits for both of them. So, yeah. So I've seen that companies actually change their architecture completely, 100%, from an existing solution built using Windows technology, running on .NET, built in VB.NET and C++ and C Sharp, running in their own data center or Windows machines, and they went to Scala running in the AWS cloud with an AWS all-in strategy. Although they had an existing successful business, and the only motivation, well, okay, there was actually two. One motivation, one key motivation was to, um, to get new employees attracted to this company because they couldn't find people who wanted to do the Windows stuff in this particular city, in this particular context, not trying to dis Windows or .NET developers here. That was just in this particular case. They couldn't find them. They made this switch. They were very attractive. People started coming to them. The second reason for that was that they had just got bought by a new investor, and that investor wanted to dress up the company for the next sale five years from now, and they sort of concluded that they wouldn't be able to sell this five years from now because then the problem would be even worse. So that may be, may be a way of doing that. Possibly, 
positive influence, right, could also be very negative because if you have people who like the old architecture, it's highly likely that they're going to look for a new job if they can find one. So again, that may be what you want or it may be something that you should watch out for. Okay. So what else do we have? Um, going a bit quickly here because of time reasons, Conway maneuvering, you've probably read people talk or heard people talk about the reverse Conway maneuver. If you don't know Conway, Conway's law says that architecture and organization are very closely related and that architecture actually mirrors the organization. And you can sort of use organizational challenge, uh, changes to drive architectural changes. So if your company happens to want to decentralize, you can use that as a way to introduce a decentralized architecture. If your company wants to um, have less operations people, then you can use that as a reason to move something somewhere else, right? Those things are possibly a way that you can effect certain kinds of changes. So, I've seen some of you make screenshots, so I'll put those slides online, right? So you can look at the patterns later on. And again, I, I encourage you to tell me more, to tell me about patterns that you found successful in your own companies, or and to tell me where you think these could work, or what the problems with them are. Let me summarize. So first of all, I think a key thing in any human endeavor, in any kind of change, no matter what kind of change it is that you want to effect, is you need to have allies, right? You need to make sure people are not your enemies. Because you can't change an organism like a company, and that's what it is, right? It's an organism made up of all the systems, all the decisions, all the processes, all the people, all their opinions and all that they are. This organism can't be changed just by you alone. That would be like, you know, injecting a few brain cells into a human being and hoping they'll change into a different person. That's not how it's work, how it'll work. You'll have to build alliances, you have to find allies who, who help you, and the best way to do that is to understand what motivates them and um, make sure that they're on the, your side and not against you. If you want to disrupt, disrupt with care, right? Be very, very careful. Think of what you want to do and what the right order is and what's most important to you and what, what the battle of the day should be. And maybe, you know, think something would be really great, but maybe don't do it now. Also, don't do the opposite thing. Don't, you know, don't not say, don't end up not saying what's right just because you're too afraid. Sometimes you have to say, well, this is just completely stupid. And if we did it that way, we could do it with, uh, with uh, you know, 1% of the effort. Sometimes you have to be that clear. Organize the organizational change, because if you forget about the organization, um, then, um, then um, many things won't be possible. So I didn't have time to go into them or in, in, a, into a, in a lot of detail, but the whole Conway connection, right? The whole idea that organization and architecture are so strongly related often mean that to change architecture, you have to change the organization as well. And you have to be very aware of this. Whatever you do, ensure positive business outcome, right? So. Something like this, right? Thank God we can invest in cool new technology and a sound architecture is not something any stakeholder ever has, has ever uttered anywhere, right? This is not how stakeholders think. Your business stakeholders, why would they? So be aware of this and do cool things. Thanks, that's all. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for reminding us of all the cognitive biases that go behind all those uh, behaviors that you described in the first half of your mm -hmm. presentation. And I'm sure all of us will be able to leave this tent with uh, tons of practical uh, suggestions that you, uh, that you gave us. Now, it's time for our Q&A session. You can hit up slido.com and uh, upload the questions. And after the Q&A session, you'll be able to rate this talk. <laughs> so, uh, here's our first question. Do you have any tips on how to deal with people motivated by the wrong things? <laughs> wrong, quote yeah. unquote. Well, it depends on your role, right? If you're, let's say you're a manager and you have those people who work for you or report to you, then it's a, it's a, I think the best advice would be to channel that energy into positive things, right? So if they want to play, give them a chance to play with stuff. Just make sure they don't play with the main product, right? Maybe change the architecture so that they can change parts of it without having that effect everywhere. And maybe be open to, uh, to their ideas, you know, give them a chance to play, and then be open to, the, to look at the results and maybe use them for, 
for good outcome. But sometimes you just have to be, uh, have to tell them that this is not something that you can risk and you have to convince them. Connecting to the previous talk that I did, you just have to be a negotiator and you know, have to defend your decisions here as well. If it's a peer, it's again probably very much dependent on what kind of stereotype they are, right? If they're um, um, the vendor agent, I'm, I don't really have though, that many ideas except for you know, just maybe occasionally suggest that other people have good stuff as well. It's not going to work if it's a real vendor agent, it's not going to work. So sometimes you just have to be aware of it and there's not much you can do. Um, but always listen to what they say and always try to understand the motivation and so that at least you can draw your own conclusions. So that was not very helpful, but that's all I can do at the moment. <laughs> so uh, there are two more questions with many, many upvotes. Uh, we would cho I'll choose the, choose the first one. Which one of these types, personality types, uh, do you find it the hardest to work with? So, so it's a hard question. Yeah, it's a hard question. So thinking of the ones that I mentioned, probably the, the process person. Because I'm, really? I'm, I'm allergic to processes. I, I, and it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's a weakness, it's not a strength. It's, it's a weakness. I, I sometimes I'm allergic to reasonable, useful processes as well. So somebody who really loves them, and I, myself, we're not going to connect very nicely. So still, you have to get by with people, so we'll find a way, but it's hard. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry, but we've run out of time. I'm sure Stefan will be available I will. around the venue uh, for your questions to answer. And uh, we are going to have a 12-minute uh, break after this. So thank you, Stefan, for this amazing speech.